Hey, um, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, apparently, you just started to downpour. I hope you all have made it in time. Uh, I'm Hoi Long. I'm the director of the Japan Committee, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome uh, our uh, lecturer today, Professor uh, Naoki uh, Umemori. And to, um, before I do that, uh, first I want to uh, thank, give a few thank yous. First, uh, this event is co sponsored by the Japan Studies Committee as well as iHouse uh, through their iHouse Global Voices program. And also want to thank uh, C staff as ever and always um, for their support in helping this event come together. Uh, Abby Newman, Connie Yip, and Myra Su. So this is actually the 12th uh, lecture in the Najita Distinguished Lecture Series, um, a series that for about a decade now has allowed us to invite a whole range of uh, prominent uh, intellectuals including writers like Oi Kenzaburo and Tawara Yoko, uh, sociologists like Ue no Chizuko and Ubu Meiji, and prominent intellectual historians like Yanita Ryuichi and Nobukuni Koyasu. Uh, and today we'll continue this wonderful tradition with uh, historian Naoyuki Omemori who, um, from Waseda University, whom Susan Burns will introduce in just a moment. But before we get to that, I want to say just a few words about uh, the lecture series and uh, Professor Tetsuo Najita, for whom it was created and named after. He's the Robert S. Ingersoll Distinguished Service Professor in Meridius of History and East Asian Languages and Civilizations. Uh, he joined the faculty of the University of Chicago in 1969 after studying at Grinnell College in Harvard, uh, and his expertise was in Japan's early modern and modern intellectual history. And he produced an extensive body of work on that subject, which includes the 1967 Harakei and the Politics of Compromise, followed in 1980 by a monograph on Japan's intellectual foundations and his prize-winning Visions of Virtue, the Kaitokudo Merchant Academy of Osaka in 1987. He retired from Chicago in 2002, but has continued to actively publish, uh, most recently a book in 2009 called Ordinary Economies in Japan, a Historical Perspective, 1759 to 1950. Uh, 19, yeah, 1950. So uh, much of this impressive body of scholarship was ordered by the assertion that historians must always engage with the moral and political issues of their time, uh, an assertion that inspired his students. Um, and for Professor Najita, one way to do this was by trying to understand the, quote, attitudes, modes of perception, and patterns of action that stood outside of static structures and spilled beyond their own times into later moments. At points, he described this as a project of writing a history of consciousness, which he says was one of the most, says it's one of the most elusive tasks for historians. And yet, as he wrote in Visions of Virtue, quote, Historians are constantly reminded in their researches that bits and pieces of thought from previous ideological systems may be reassembled and put to new uses, particularly in the process of shaping ideological visions of the future. It was this difficult work of recovering the bits and pieces to which Professor Najita dedicated himself, a task which complicated the very notion of what history is and how we understand its progression. And our speaker today promised to further, promises to further complicate this notion. So I'm going to hand the floor over now to Professor Susan Burns, the director of CIS and uh, professor of history, who will introduce us to her. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, this is an event that is always very close to my heart since I was a student of Tetsuo Najita, um, and our speaker today, Umen san also worked with him as well. So I'm truly delighted to welcome Professor Umen Mori Naoyuki back to the University of Chicago. Uh, we first became acquainted in the late 1980s when we were both graduate students here. I was a student in ALC, and Professor Umen Mori uh, was a student in the PhD program in our political science department which he came to after completing a BA and an MA at Waseda University. His 2002 dissertation was entitled Modernization Through Colonial Mediation, the Establishment of the Police System in Meiji Japan. A specialist in the history of modern political thought, Professor Maimori's research interests are wide-ranging and include social theory and the history of nationalism, socialism, colonialism, and Asianism. 
He's published more than 30 articles and has edited and co-edited several volumes of essays on topics such as Benedict Anderson and Globalization, the 100th year anniversary of the Haymesha, the Commoner Society and Early Socialist Organization, and on regional integration in East Asia. He's also the translator of Harry Hartunian's Overcome by Modernity. And if you know this work, and I know many of you do, you will appreciate what an endeavor it must have been to render an interviewable Japanese. Um, in 2016, Professor Umori published an important monograph, I have it here, uh, on early socialism in Japan called Shoki Shakai Shuri no Topography, Osugi Sakai to Sono Jidai, which I could translate as The Topography of Early Socialism, Osugi Sakai in his era, and it's kind of a culmination of uh, many years of research. His talk today is also concerned with intellectual topographies is called America in Japan and Japan in America towards a topographical analysis of Japanese intellectual history from Kotoko Shusui to Echo Jun. So please join me in welcoming our professor Memoi Nawa. I first came to the University of Chicago in 1991. As a first year PhD student in the Department of Political Science, I still remember very clearly the day when I arrived at the Wea Airport for the first time. The sky was dark, the wind was chilly even in early summer, the city looks dusty. In my first visit to, it was my first visit to the United States. Moreover, it was my first experience to travel abroad from Japan. Please imagine how nervous I was at the time. I did not have any close friends to whom I could depend. And I did not have any confidence in my academic abilities. I was so worried about whether I could survive here. Then I visited the university bookstore on the first day of my stay at the University of Chicago and found this marker. <laughs> which said, abandon all your home year food and here, the University of Chicago. This is how I encountered Chicago. <laughs> More than 25 years have passed since I took my first step on this campus. In those intervening 25 years, I fortunately got my PhD and returned to Japan and have been working as a professor at private university. Now I'm old enough to reflect on my academic life and remember the days of Hyde Park more often. Without a doubt, my graduate study at the University of Chicago made a huge impact on my personal life. But recently, I came to be interested in situating my own experience in a more broader context of intellectual history. What significance did my stay in Chicago have in Japanese intellectual history? This is a topic I would like to talk about this evening. I understand that this way of delivering a lecture is allowed only for great scholars, and I'm not such a person. But I would claim that this is the originality of this lecture. You will have a chance to listen to personal stories from great people. However, at least publicly, if it will be difficult for you to have another chance to listen to a personal story from a person who is not so great, if you miss this opportunity. 
I sincerely hope all of you are patient enough to not to leave this room now and stay with me until the end of this lecture. As you know, <coughs> Japan has a long and complicated history with the United States. Many Japanese came to this country even before the major restoration. As shipwrecked sailors, government officials, immigrant workers, students, professors, artists, prostitutes, and vagabonds. Many Japanese stayed in this country and returned to Japan or remained in the United States. Some of those returnees wrote about their experience in the United States and published their reflections for their fellow Japanese. Those publications have accumulated so much as to constitute a literary journal. In this way, tremendous amounts of observations about America have been recorded in, so to speak, an inventory of Japanese books. Unfortunately, most of these texts have been unknown to most American readers because they were written in Japanese for Japanese readers. This journal seems unpopular even among the scholar of Japan because their main research interest has been Japan, not America. However, I suggest that this journal is worthy of course reading for several reasons. First, these texts were written by many different authors, from famous intellectuals to almost unknown people. The quality of their observations is almost diverse, but still each text captured a specific aspect of American society. Second, we can use this challenge to analyze how Japanese have projected their own images in the image of America. In a sense, the transformations of images of America in Japanese text constitute a significant symptom that indicates the transformation of Japan itself. Since I first came to Chicago, I came to be interested in reading the text written about America by Japanese authors. By reading those texts, I came to situate my own experience in the inventory of those accumulated Japanese reflections on America. Why did I came to Chicago? 25 years ago, my answer was quite simple. To get a PhD for my future academic job. But now I can answer this same question in a more complex way. Why did I come to Chicago? The following story is my tentative answer to this question. In the following discussion, I focus on Edo Jun first, a famous literary critique as one of the most important ideologues of post-war Japanese conservatives, and examine how his experience in America contributed to the production of his ideology. There were three reasons why I have chosen Eto as my subject. First, Eto is a great literary critique known for his writings on Natsume Soseki and Kobayashi Hideo, both of whom I respect a lot. Second, he had an experience of staying in the United States and admitted that the experience had a huge impact on his way of thinking. 
He came to the United States for the first time as a research fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation and spent two years at Princeton University. Later, he published his experiences as a book titled America to Watashi. Maybe I can translate America and I. So we can analyze closely how he encountered America and what he learned from it. Third, and foremost, the ideology Eto produced in Princeton has gained critical significance in current political situations. Besides books and articles about Japanese literature, Eto produced many texts related to Japanese history, many of which focus on the problematic nature of the relationship between Japan and the United States in the post war period. After he stayed in the United States, he started to problematize the censorship imposed by GHQ during the occupation period, which led to his critique of how Japan's post-war constitution was imposed by American occupation forces. Eto's writing in the early 1980s arguably served as a canonical role in establishing the historical revisionism that came to proliferate during the 1990s, which in turn led to the constitutional reform proposals under the current Abe cabinet. In post war Japan, being a conservative meant to live an almost schizophrenic life. On the one hand, as an anti communist living during the Cold War, he or she must accept the military presence of America as the most important ally. On the other hand, as a nationalist, she or he must legitimize the history of Japan, which led to the war against America. From their point of view, America must be accepted and rejected simultaneously. This was the main aporia that all conservatives in Japan had to face. I claim Eto was the first person to give a coherent answer to this difficult problem, and we can analyze America to Watashi, his text, as a record of the answer he had reached and how he had got there. At the beginning of his text, Eto wrote the daily life in the first a few months at Princeton appeared as Kafkaesque Bill. His initial failure to find even the clue to understanding it deeply shook his pride as a literary critic. He remembered these first months at Princeton as days of idleness and disillusionment, in which he went through an identity crisis and experienced a social death. However, the encounter with a certain event offered Eto an opportunity for his revival. It was the news about the riot over James Meredith's entrance to the University of Mississippi in October 1962. Meredith became the first African-American student at the University of Mississippi, but his enrollment caused a riot on the Oxford campus. This indicate made Eto aware of the enduring 
opposition between the North and the South in contemporary America. Afterwards, he started researching the history of the Civil War by examining Edmund Wilson's patriotic core studies in the literature of American Civil War, and, and he was delighted to discover the following sentence about Pearl Harbor in the preface of Wilson's book. I quote, <coughs> this act, I mean, the Pearl Harbor attack by Japan, was foreseen by our government, and in order to make our antagonists in Japan, strike the first blow deliberately not for a stall at a time when a Japanese delegate was attempting to negotiate peace. End of quote. Eto discovered a friend in Wilson who attempted to review American history from the point of view of the South. This discovery made him to see the history of the South and the history of Japan as a unified field. In this way, the revisionism of American history encouraged Eto to start his own project to revise post-war Japanese historiography. In America to Watashi, Eto compared the South after the Civil War with Japan after the Pacific War and recognized some similarities between two losers. He said, the South means, in a certain sense, a foreign country within the United States. The hatred of the Southerners against the Northern is, he continues, allowed by the fact that slavery system as a way of life was forced to be abandoned by the North. In this regard, he claims the relationship between the federal government and the South is a prototype for shadowing the relationship between America and the country and the countries it defeated. Then Edo discovered crucial differences between the history of the South and the history of modern Japan. Edo contrasts the Southerners who have never stopped resisting the influence from the North with the miserable Japanese who have been destroying their own way of life voluntarily. In this context, Eto evaluated the resistance of the South as the indispensable component of American modernity against which ethics and morality have been tested and trained at national level. By contrast, Eto deplored the disappearance of ethics and morality from contemporary Japan and attributed its cause to the lack of resistance against democratization under U.S. control. By incorporating the Southerners' resistance as the indispensable element of American national dignity, Eto must have believed that he found an answer that could legitimize the history of pre-war Japan without denying the value of the post-war U.S.-Japan alliance. However, it is important to note that he could only attain this goal by identifying himself with the positionality of the Southern White. This meant by appropriating the indignation of the whites in the South, he also unconsciously internalized the racism, just as he showed no sympathy to the black people in civil rights movements that fought against racial discrimination. 
he was silent about the history of Asian nation who suffered under the Japanese imperial oppression and continued to resist Japanese colonial rule until 1945. The discovery of the U.S. South also offered Kato an important opportunity to pay close attention to various unevenness which characterize American daily life. In addition to racial oppositions, Eto obsessively recorded the various examples in American daily life which supposedly contradict American official ideology. For example, he described eating club system at Princeton University in detail. I didn't know eating club system before I read it, so I'm not sure the, uh, this is very familiar with uh, American uh, people, but uh, if you, you don't understand, please ask your neighbors what, what it is. But anyway, the, uh, it noted that there were 16 eating clubs at Princeton at the time, and those clubs were hierarchically organized. He also explained that each club selected new members largely on the basis of applicant's family background, not on their own merit. In the end, he characterized this system as feudalistic, hokentiki, the term used to characterize Japanese society before him. In contrast to Edward Said, who stayed at Princeton a decade earlier than Eto and censured the system as humiliating in his biography, Eto was delighted to experience the feudal remnant in America, which was almost disappearing in contemporary Japanese society. In America to Watashi, Eto repeatedly emphasized that America is a normal country, Futsu no Kuni, neither a model for democracy nor an incarceration of capitalism. However, Eto's understanding of normality is radically different from the one that both Japanese social scientists and American modernization theorists propose. While those scholars have even and the continuous development as a standard of normality. Eto recognized unevenness and fragmentation as a normal condition for modernity, including both Japan and the United States. Here, we should also remember that Marius Johnson who was a host professor for Eto at Princeton University, was one of the most important proponents of modernization theory at that time. Modernization theory explains the process of modernization as a process of gradual development of various social sectors while assuming that traditional countries can be brought to development in the same manner that more developed countries have with assistance. Edwin Reichel, Janssen's mentor, a professor of Harvard University and the US ambassador to Japan from 1961 to 1966, characterized Japan as playing a historic role as the first non-Western society to meet the challenges of modernization, regardless of its peculiarity and cultural tradition. Eto demonstrated that modernization, modernization theory was not applicable, not, not applicable even to America by enumerating various feudalistic elements in it. 
Edgar and Jonathan could be good friends as individuals. However, modernization theory allocated different roles to two intelligences. For Jansen, as a mentor who teaches how to modernize, and for Eto, as a disciple who must accept its teaching to modernize its own society. The discovery of feudalism in American everyday life offered Eto an alternative epistemological space in which he could juxtapose modern Japanese experiences with that of the United States on equal basis. In this alternative space, Eto believed that he could finally able to speak to dear values as his equal partner, as his equal partner, not as a student who was obliged to learn democracy from him. The Rockefeller Foundation, the donor who made it possible for Eto to study at Princeton, actively intervened in the process of Eto's ideological formation. The Rockefeller Foundation's archive preserved, preserved the documents related to Eto's, Eto Jun's scholarship program and reveals some important facts which Eto himself might not know. This is Eto's application submitted for Rockefeller Foundation scholarship program. March 12, 1962 is the date of the document. However, Eto's name appeared in the Rockefeller Foundation's document much earlier than he actually submitted his application. For example, this is the letter uh, from Satanishu, I'm talking about the right side materials, to Charles Bolton Fars, dated March 3, 1961. Satanishi worked as a director of the Oriental Department of the Library of Congress in Washington before the war, and was known as a critic who propagated the values of American democracy in post-war Japan. Faz was a Japanologist who was the director of the Humanities Division of Rockefeller Foundation at that time. In this letter, Sakabishi evaluated Eto as follows, quote, For the last three years, I have eye on him, and find he is growing and very promising. Now that we have sent several novels, we may try a critic again. The three years Sakanishi mentioned here overlaps with the period of the rise and fall of 1960s Anpo movement, the biggest social movement in Japanese history which protested against the division of the Japan-US Security Treaty. Edo's commitment to this movement was quite ambiguous. For example, he became a member of Koenaki Koenokai, Society of Voices Voice, and actively participated in the citizens' protest against the Kishi cabinet, who promoted the revision of the treaty. However, after the revision was completed, Eto came to take a distance from the movement and published an article to criticize intellectuals who supported the movement. It was this moment that Rockefeller Foundation offered his scholarship. Eto may have believed that he chose America as a place for his reflections after the collapse of the Ampo movement. But actually, America chose him 
after careful examination. After having converted himself from a supporter of Ampo movement to its critique, he could pass the examination and get the ticket for the United States. In his original application, Eto wrote his wish to study at Yale University about the life and works of Lawrence Stern, 18th century British literary critic and novelist. It is Rockefeller Foundation that decided to send him to Princeton, not to Yale, which was known as the legacy of Utro Wilson, who served as the president of Princeton from 1902 to 1910, and praising Eto, not in the English department, but under the tutelage of Maris Janssen, a Japanese uh, specialist, and the renowned advocate of modernization theory. These facts show how deeply the Rockefeller Foundation intervened in the process of Eto's ideological formation. Eto sincerely hoped Japan to be an independent partner of the United States. For this purpose, he insisted that Japan must give up its peace constitution and rearm itself. Then Japan can fight next to the United States. However, we should not forget that this was exactly what American government demanded from Japan. The US always hoped Japan to share more military burden and contribute more voluntarily to their security policies. Kato Takeshi, who published a book on the political role of private organizations such as Rockefeller Foundation and Ford Foundation, concluded as follows. The US government and private organizations such as the Rockefeller and Ford Foundation never hesitate to utilize American soft power to fullest extent to achieve political ends. I would argue that it was concerned by the ideology was nothing other than the most successful product of this sort of power. Eto came to the United States about 30 years earlier than me. When I read Eto's text, I could not help comparing my experience at Chicago with his experience at Princeton. I felt how different my America is from his America. I felt how fortunate my stay at Chicago was. At least, no eating crowd system existed uh, in this university. <coughs> I also felt how isolated Eto was at Princeton. This isolation seemed to make him believe that he must represent Japan and confront with America by himself. I came to Chicago and stayed here in the period in which Japan sent students to America most aggressively. 1990s was a high noon of Japanese students in the United States. In 1964, the final year I stayed in the United States, only 3,382 Japanese students stayed in the United States. In 1991, I was one of 40,700 Japanese students. Because of Japan's hyper economic development that led to the bubble economy, of overseas graduate education became much popularized. As a member of bubble generation, 
I was free from any kind of elitism while I was staying at Chicago. When I participated in the seminar on Japanese history led by Professor Najita and Susan was one of my senpai at that time, professors and students had already started critically reviewing modernization theory as an epistemological manifestation of colonialism and orientalism. I did not have to be obliged to explain the uniqueness of Japan as a Japanese person for Western audiences. More than that, I could meet many international students and got many friends, particularly from Korea and Taiwan in those seminars, in addition to American friends. My encounter with those students came to be realized through the economic development and the political democratization in Korea and in Taiwan. So this is a historical background. I could agree with Eto when he problematized the colonial relationship between Japan and the United States in post war period. However, conversation with Taiwanese friends and Korean friends always reminded me of the history of the Empire of Japan that lasted until 1945. How Korean people, how Taiwanese people experienced Japanese colonial rule and resisted against it. Most of my friends from Korea and Taiwan had participated in democratization movement in their own countries before they came to Chicago. I also learned from them the significance of social movement, which had been disappearing from Japanese campus during in 1980s when I was an undergraduate student. About a year ago, I published a book about the history of Japanese socialism, and I came to recognize how much, I ex how much my experience at Chicago reflected as the motive of this book. While preparing this book manuscript, I kept thinking about another author's experience in America and compared my experience with his. His name is Koto Kshusui, who was a famous early socialist at the beginning of the 20th century and executed as an anarchist in high treason incident of 1911. Please look at uh, these pictures. Uh, they, those are the founding members of the uh, Social Democratic Party established in 1902, and Kotoku was one of them. Because America has been always anti-communist, some people may be surprised if I say that Japanese early socialism, the wellspring of socialism, anarchism, and communism was made in USA. Let me briefly explain the background of these people. Katayama-san, the next to the uh, Kotoku, uh, an influential leader in international communist movement in the 1920s, joined in establishing the party after he studied at Greenland College. I really want to emphasize this because the uh, same school which uh, Professor Najita graduated uh, from, and also the uh, Yale Divinity School. Katayama was a Christian and he came to the United States to study Christianity, where he encountered the social gospel movement and attempted to apply Christian ethics to social problems. 
including poverty issues and labor movements. Abe Iso, a professor at Waseda University, Unitarian preacher and social democrat, also studied in the United States. He graduated from Hartford Seminary before he became a socialist. The other three members, except Kotoku, Kinoshita Naoe, Nishikawa Mitsujiro, and Kanukan Kiyoshi, were also Christian. The backgrounds of these founders demonstrate how deeply the spirit and the practice of American Christianity contributed to the emergence of the Japanese socialist movement. I wish I could speak more about uh, these Christians who imported socialism from the United States to Japan, but I would like to concentrate on Kotok Shusui, who did not have any Christian background. Kotoku was known as a disciple of Nakai Chomi, a famous philosopher and materialist who translated the works of Jean Jacques Rousseau. Kotoku joined the socialist movement as an extension of people's rights movement, a nationalist movement from the grassroots in Meiji, mid Meiji period. In his later years, Kotoku had been continuingly oppressed by Meiji government, which started controlling its subject in the name of the emperor. The Social Democratic Party was ordered to disband after two days from its establishment. Kotoku was forced to cease publishing the coroner's news in 1905 which he was started in 1903 with the aim of preventing the Russo Japanese War. In 1905 to 1906, he went to San Francisco and stayed there for eight months. This stay in the United States had a crucial significance for the history of Japanese socialism as well as for his personal life. Immediately after he came back to Japan, he declared his conversion from socialism to anarchism. His declaration caused a serious confusion because he was considered to be a leading socialist at that time. This was a crucial moment in which anarchism emerged as a separate school from socialism. How could we America be a source of anarchism for Japanese intellectuals at that time? Unlike the case of Katayama, Abe, and most Japanese intellectuals who hoped for study in established universities on the East Coast, Kodok stayed in the community of immigrants in San Francisco. Kodok himself was quite conscious of the specificity of his experience in the community of immigrants. He wrote in a letter from San Francisco as follows, quote, I have not known the middle or upper class of America yet. I don't want to know it either. This photo showed what kind of people he interacted with during his stay. Immigrants and refugees from Japan and Russia. Through the experience of living together with the people who left their nation behind, Kotoku discovered the possibility of people living without the state. He was already familiar with some of the works of anarchists such as Kropotkin's, but it was in San Francisco that he came to understand the possibility of anarchists from the bottom of his heart. For him, being an anarchist meant living a life that resisted against the growing ideological power of the emperor system. When Kotoku was arrested and executed in 1911 as a leader of fake conspiracy against 
Emperor Meiji, the protest movement against the Japanese government in, in this country were organized on a much larger scale than in Japan. Finally, I would like to introduce the third person who could mediate the experience of Gotoku and the experience of Eto to Chicago. His name is Fuji Ryoichi, the editor and publisher of Chicago Shinpo, a Chicago-based Japanese-American newspaper. Fuji was an illegal immigrant who came to the United States as a student. After he earned an MA degree from Oberlin College, he spent several years in New York and Los Angeles as a member of the American Communist Party. In February 1942, he was deported to Heart Mountain Relocation Center. Ironically, the job he assigned to him in the camp was to lecture about the history of American democracy to Japanese inmates. While performing this task, Fuji came to recognize the significance of American constitution that declared the equality of human rights. In the lectures conducted within the barbed wires, he attempted to show how the oppression of Japanese Americans violated the spirit of American constitution. After he established the Chicago Shinpo in 1945, he published many articles to promote Japanese Americans' basic rights by appealing to the spirit of American Constitution. Also important to Fuji was the enactment of the new Japanese Constitution, which would demonstrate the future of his fatherland. He carefully followed its framing and published many articles about it in Chicago Shinpo. His articles are quite distinctive in that he attempted to evaluate the drafting of Japanese constitution by the standard of American constitution from the perspective of a non-citizen living in the United States. In addition, Fuji had a clear advantage over contemporary Japanese journalists who could not criticize the policies of GHQ publicly under censorship. Fuji criticized various policies practiced by GHQ as contrary to the spirit of American constitution. So, so this is a newsletter Fuji published. It was not published. He actually wrote in hand. So this was a kind of the uh, uh, prototype of Chicago Shinpo. Uh, this uh, prototype he called newsletter. He keep delivering in this newsletter to the friends uh, he met in the uh, relocation center, uh, he keep insisting uh, his own political uh, ideas about American constitutions to his fellow Japanese. Okay, for example, he published an article titled the Declaration of Independence and the Japan Problem on Early on July 4th, 1946, in which he characterized collusive relationship between GHQ and the Japanese government as colonial. According to Fuji, in order to keep Japan within the American bloc at the advent of the Cold War, GHQ began to ally with the conservative government and oppressed the Japanese people who protested for further democratization. He evaluated resistant Japanese people to represent Thomas Jefferson's independent 
different state. People tend to view Japanese history and American history as two separate subjects. People also like to categorize their intellectuals in accordance with their ideology. Then, in each nation, we have produced a variety of intellectual histories. The history of socialism, the history of constitutionalism, or the history of conservatism have been considered as if they were an independent discipline in each nation by focusing on its chronological transformation within each category. People are satisfied by situating Kotoku in the history of socialism, Fuji in the history of constitutionalism, and Eto in the history of conservatism independently. Why I did here is an exercise to analyze different histories of Japan and the United States as a unified field. This is a perspective which I would like to call topographical analysis of intellectual history. We cannot simply categorize their thoughts as Japanese because their thoughts were produced as a reaction to their experience in the United States. Neither can we generalize their experience as American because its contents and implications were quite different to each other. The, specific, the specificities of each thought should be considered as a reflection conducted by each thinker in a particular space in which the dynamics of global capitalism. We cannot simply categorize a Western nation as advanced and no Western nations as less advanced because cap capitalism always induces uneven development, not only globally but also locally. In other words, the development of capitalism always produces a spatial configuration which can be characterized as the synchronicity of the non synchronous. The spatial configuration the spatial coexistence in the same time period of historically heterogeneous practices and social formations. Although the image of America were radically different from each other, Kotoku, Fuji, and Eto captured the aspect of the synchronicity of the non synchronous brought by the development of the book uh, by global by the development of global capitalism. This is the reason why we can hear their lingering voices in the contemporary debates over such topics as Occupy Wall Street, Revision of Japanese Constitution, or Civil War Revisionism, because we are still doomed to live in the same heterogeneity. Kodok stayed in San Francisco in 1906, and 56 years later, in 1962, Eto came to Princeton. Now, to, in 2018, when more than 56 years have passed since Eto's experience of America, I'm standing here and discuss this with you in Chicago. Now I feel obliged to convey my own humble reflections on America for the Japanese people, American people, and the people of the world, just as my predecessors did. My Chicago is different from Kotoku, San Francisco, and from Eto's place. I understand that the difference is not simply due to the personalities, nor historical transformations of Japan and the United States. It was Chicago, its history, topography, and the people who have lived here 
which made me the person I am now. Thank you very much.